Okay, this is the Smyrna bath. This is a very, very large bathroom in relationship to some of the bathrooms that I've done. This has a lot of space in it. There used to be a double vanity right here. One of them is gone. And then a little, you know, chair portion right there. Um, eventually, what this will look like is a, a travertine bathroom. This is builder's grade, four inch, you know, white tile with non-sanded grout on the entire floor. Um, seeing its better days, as we go into the shower area, this mold and mildew is because, again, builder's grade, um, four by four ceramic with non-sanded grout is never, ever, ever a good idea to put on a shower floor for a lot of different reasons, the least of which is the water penetration into the pan. So through the years, um, water has saturated this pan. When I do the tear out today, I already know that there's gonna be all kinds of water that's saturated in there. It'll be a relatively easy tear out because that water will, will have breaking, broken down um, the adhesion properties of the mortar that's under here. So it's gonna come out like a sand mix the way it started out when they poured it. So that'd be relatively easy, but this is the reason that you have mold and mildew on the shower in the corners because the water can't really escape. And when it hits the air over here, you know, just starts growing mold and mildew, which will never stop. You know, obviously they try to caulk it and everything else. People will bleach, it'll go away for a week or so and then it'll grow right back again. So this is never, never a good idea to have this type of tile in the bathroom, but then again, when they're building a house, they're not really concerned with spending a lot on quality tile. And of course, they don't seal nothing, so that um, it lies a bigger problem too. Um, but anyway, uh, getting back to the bathroom as a whole, this uh, tub will stay, and um, we have a toilet closet over here. We're just going to take that toilet out and replace it at the end of the job. But this will be a travertine bathroom. It's going to be 16 by 16 travertine. That's going to be um, just straight cut all the way down um, on the floor. And it'll go on this tub face also. And it'll go one tile up 16 inches is about where that window sill is at. So it's going to go 16 inches and then we're going to use this uh, trim piece, which is a little off color from the travertine. Um, but it was on sale for like three dollars, and that's that's a great price So she wants to use that to trim out on the top and also on the front of here And then also it'll be on the side and going around and Down the wall, so we have enough of that to do that job the 4x4 four four tumble marble Will go on the shower floor Which is this here broken piece, but that will go on the shower floor um, and of course, you know, we'll use sand and grout and we'll seal it and all that stuff. So that'll be a much better application for that. There will be a niche in the back wall. She's already drawn it out. So that's going to be approximately 32 inch by 12 inch knit, niche. And the same tumble marble will go on the back of that niche. Um, she's also going to do a design over here, which I'm not really sure uh, what the design is going to look like quite yet. But we're going to use the same trim both on the niche just like that right and you know the way i always frame them out with these these trim pieces um, and i think we're also going to use it right here so we're going to do a square around the new shower valve and um, there'll be some type of mosaic or something inlaid there oh and i didn't even see that another recessed shelf so she obviously wants one here too probably for the soap uh, so that'll be a small one and then there'll be a new shower fixture as well, which I have not seen. Um, so it's pretty standard as far as the 16 by 16 tile goes and, you know, everywhere that you see, uh, this tile is going to be 16 by 16. The bench will go away. Uh, that's going to extend the shower out um, probably a good two or three square feet larger. It's already a large shower, but it's going to be bigger now. Um, we're also going to take it, I believe, about halfway up this wall here. So the final curve will be about right here. And that's going to give another two or three square feet. So overall, we're going to make this shower about maybe six feet, six square feet bigger than it is already, um, which will be nice. So the curve is going to go across here. 
and um, they probably just turn a corner over here because uh, she is not going with shower doors after the job is done. After all the tile is set and everything, I will be building a block wall. See this glass block here? This is actually larger than I'll be using. Um, I think these are 12, maybe 13 inch block. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to be using 8 inch block. So if you can imagine, the 8 inch block will actually butt up against this tub right here. And it will go up probably where that tile is at, about, about 72 inches or so. Um, so the glass block will be a wall, solid wall going across here and it will stop, right? So there'll be a rounded block at the end of here. And then over here on this wall where the curb is at, on top of the curb, we'll also be building a wall, same 72 inches, right? And so that'll go all the way up and it'll come out probably up to about the 24 or 28 inch mark. So if you can imagine this wall coming out to here, this wall coming out to here, there'll be no shower door. Obviously the shower is big enough that, especially at that point, where no shower door will be needed because there will be no water spray. Um, so it's actually quite a um, different design which I, I really really like and I'm looking forward to the end result because I like the idea of using glass block as opposed to all this you know shower door especially the frame but even the frameless uh, on a shower this big is going to cost somewhere between about fourteen eighteen hundred dollars to make that happen I think the glass block is going to be cheaper than that. Plus, it'll be a different look that I don't do very often. So, um, that will be nice. So, uh, this is day one, and the demo is about to happen. And if I run into any issues, then I will, I will turn this back on and continue, um, which I might do anyway, just for the sake of people seeing what I'm talking about as far as this pan being saturated. Once I tear all this out, I'm going to show that there is real water damage. I anticipate, well, I already know that this pan will be saturated with water, but I also anticipate that this is a wood structure in here and that a lot of this wood is rotted. Um, so when I get to that point, I will turn it back on and show you all that stuff. Okay, so uh, part, of, part of the tear out is uh, gone. They actually, this uh, job was young enough that they had a dura rock on the wall. So the dura rock, and it was double layered. They had dura rock and sheet rock, and then tile on top of that. So, um, well, I'm sorry, it was it was sheet rock first, and then dura rock on top of that, and then tile, which is kind of redundant considering the type of tile and all that stuff was, but it probably saved the walls from having a bunch of issues, although no red guard was ever used. So it's just a matter of time before, had this mold and mildew not started, it's a matter of time before water would penetrate into the back wall because, you know, both of those things are porous. Anyway, getting over to the partial demo part, this is a very interesting thing going on. It's almost as if they we're kind of playing this by ear because if you notice this pan, the pan liner is actually what it's called. The pan liner was never really set up against this partial knee wall. So it's got this slope and when I started tearing out the mortar, the mortar was probably barely an inch thick over here. I mean just barely and it kind of tapered down this direction. Um, it's very odd that as much pan liner as that they used on this partial bench that they, they, they didn't just set it up set it up you know close to the to the two by fours and stuff like that that this bench is made out of so that's very odd it would have made this area very weak anyway um, but as you can see what I said earlier about this sand this is this is mortar this is you know what you pour a pan with and it's wet as I already told you it would be um, but it's also grainy and it's turned back to sand. So all the adhesion factors that, that you know, mortar has Portland cement in it, um, the cement portion is gone and what you're left with is sand. Just over time, you know, the chemicals of the water and all that stuff saturating it. So what they did in here is they, they put it on dura rock, with, which, you know, is okay. They attached the dura rock to the wall, um, though they used a lot of, lot of nails and big nails too. There was really no purpose in that. Um, but, you know, they... They made sure they adhered it to, to 
this wall with this shower pan going up, this pan liner that went up, if you can see, they took it all the way up to the lip here, right? And they said, well, that's not enough. Let's get another piece. And so they started way back there and they overlapped this thing, right? So if you did have water leakage or, or whatever on this, and this was flat already, water wouldn't have really fallen off. But if you did have water, you know, it would naturally want to go in that direction. And then you've got a double, double pan liner. Although they never glued it, you know, it was just kind of hanging there with the Dura Rock on top of it. So that's kind of odd that they went to such an extraordinary effort on not even a spec home, on just a builder's grade type home. They went to an extraordinary effort to use a bunch of pan liner to protect this bench, right? But then you come over here to the curb, <laughs> and the curb has one, two, three, four, at least four sheets of pieced together pan liner to overlap with the curb. So this one overlaps that one, which overlaps that one. It's wet, it's saturated wetness up under the pan liner um, for a lot of different reasons, but the least of which, if you're gonna piece together this pan liner, the pan liner companies uh, make a special glue, it's a PVC glue, that, you know, they should have just dabbed some of that glue on there. It's supposed to be a two to three inch overlap of this pan liner. So like this piece right here was just kind of scabbed in for no particular reason than to hide the wood, right? But that didn't do any good because look at all that wetness. And you know, they never glued the pan liner together. So all these four pieces, actually five now, um, were never glued together. And then of course a lot of nails in it um, kind of defeats the purpose of having the liner. So, um, but then they used a whole bunch of liner over here to protect the bench where, you know, the benches usually have some, some damage and stuff like that in the wood. I don't think this one's going to because there are so many layers going on here that the water never never got to it. Um, and the curb is, is okay. You can tell, especially in the corners, which I always see damage in the corners, you can tell it's a little rotted. You can tell that it's a little soft also. So there is still a whole bunch of water saturation. That they, that they didn't do the one simple thing and take the rest of this pan liner from that direction, one solid piece, and just you know bring it around and wrap the curb, as I always do, and should be done, um, would have negated all these pieces that they put together. But if they're gonna put pieces together, at least glue them so that you have a contiguous um, piece, okay? And then look here. You have, from where the tile was to the top of this pan is about three quarters of an inch, right? where the towel used to be anyway, is three quarters of an inch. And then way over here, you have about six, seven inches, right? It's just, it's just shoddy, right? Pan liners should typically go about six to eight inches up. Some people like to do higher, maybe 12 inches or whatever. Um, I usually go about six inches up at a minimum. Um, and this is like three quarters of an inch up. So, you know, it's just kind of weird. As much liner, again, as they used over here, but where it really matters is over here, they didn't use nothing. Of course, you can see all this mortar has turned to sand also. So it's pretty prevalent. And when I get the rest of it out, it's gonna be all wet. So there was no doubt in my mind that was going on. So with all that weirdness, here's the weirdest thing. And I've never seen this done this way. Look at here, sheetrock all the way down the wall, right? Then the pan lighter, okay? And then, well, what goes over that? Well, that's why we use the Dura Rock. Right? We use the Dura Rock to overlap that onto the sheetrock. And that's why we had the double layer going on here to begin with. You had sheetrock, and then you had the Dura Rock on top of that, so that they could kind of sort of do it the same way I do, except I don't have anything against here, right? When I pour the next pan, all this studding will be bare. And if you look on my other videos, you'll see, <coughs> excuse me, that the pan liner will go up these studs, and of course I put in two by sixes in between them, just to kind of brace the pan with all the weight from the, the thin the mortar. Um, so all that's done first before any wallboard goes up whatsoever. And so what they did is they just had wallboard up already, and decided, you know what, we could just attach the pan straight to the wallboard, and then put on the Dura Rock to overlap. Of course, this never got overlapped very much at all. And so that's very odd. I have never, ever, ever seen a pan installed this way. Um, good, bad, or indifferent, you know. I don't see any leakage or anything like that, so I don't know that 
I mean, I would never do it. I don't know that if these guys are still doing it that way that there is going to be an issue with it. But the least they could have done is used a little bit more liner going up all around, you know, a little bit of moisture stuff going on here. Of course, that could be that could be uh, just roach droppings and stuff. Um, but anyway, there's a few oddities that I don't see too often. I've never ever seen a piece of scab in on the curb, although that doesn't really surprise me. But I've definitely never seen wallboard first in the pan liner, so that's where we're at. So I'm going to finish up here. Okay, normally I don't show, um, well, I don't interrupt my video unless there's an issue. In this case, there's a little bit of an issue, as you can see already. I've kind of, you know, made the shower larger up to this about midway on the wall, um, which is what the customer wanted. So the best you can do is a six by, what is it, six by eight shower pan. And um, the six is the width, and then of course the length is eight foot. So in this case, I actually needed seven, which I cannot get a seven foot shower pan. So what you do, and this is important, is you overlap this at least two inches, right? So I have a little that I want to wrap the over edge of this uh, curb with. So you just cut out another scrap piece and you overlap it two inches. Over in the corner, I had to make a cut because I couldn't go around this bend without making the cut down here. And so this pan, you know, got on the floor, but there's nothing on the wall. So again, you know, I cut a little piece and there's a two inch overlap. And there's a special PVC glue that Home Depot or any place sells that sells the shower pan. You must use this glue and you must follow the directions. Anyway, it kind of goes on like contact cement. So in other words, once you have both surfaces um, with the brush um, nice and uh, it's just smear on the glue, it's got a little little ball or a little cotton type of thing at the end of that. Um, once you smear it on on both surfaces, you let it dry for a good 30 minutes to an hour or so. Then you press them down and you hold them down, same as over here, and um, let the two bond. And then you have, you know, what you need because that's the only way to do it until they start making a seven or eight wide shower pan, which they don't. So there you go. This pan goes up uh, where it's important goes up on both sides. This shower is so big this side will never even see water most likely and I'm about probably six six and a half inches up the wall all the way around. So there you go. Um, that's an important thing to know because if you don't do it that way then you end up with the crap that the other guy did having three or four different pieces on the curb. Um, and there you go. Okay this is day 10 uh, this job and um, I'm done. I'm out of here. This is uh, this has been a little bit of a challenge for a few reasons which I'll go into but I'll start at the beginning so I always do my transition strip here at the very beginning. Um, I didn't put any baseboard down. A uh, customer is going to repaint this bathroom. I don't know what color but um, the baseboard would go after the painting. Uh, the baseboard usually gets primed and painted as well. So this is the toilet closet area. Of course, it's all travertine, as I had told you from the beginning. 18, or I'm sorry, 16 by 16 travertine. So we put the travertine on the um, tub also, and then these were already here before. If you remember, uh, she bought some new ones, so um, I tiled around the holes and put those on. Um, this this trim tile which is this stuff right here. We we're going to put on the face of the tub right along here, but I was precluded from doing that because of these grates. So instead, I used um, this aluminum transition that kind of sets at an angle. It actually slides up under the tile, and what you see is this little angled um, transition from this top tile to this face tile. So that turned out pretty well. And then I was able to use <coughs> these trim tile up and around. I didn't have a whole lot of tub area surface to, to deal with on this backsplash, so there's only, I don't know, probably about eight of these that got used. And of course, I cut off the excess here so that I can continue um, down to the floor. And um, it turned out okay. You know, I kind of like it. She already had glass block on her window here. And so her idea, rather than paying all the money for, you know, the shower door, which is not really needed, and I'll tell you why in a minute. 
um, she decided to follow that lead with glass block and do these eight inch glass block on both the right side and the left side coming into the shower. And uh, then of course the vanities got changed out. So this is a Home Depot thing. Um, they're separate pieces, obviously. So you got the sink, mm, drawers and cabinet, sink, drawers and cabinet. Um, so those aren't quite finished yet. They need to be caulked in and set and all that stuff, but they are plumbed in and ready to go. Anyway, so getting to the shower, which is why I was here to begin with. Um, this has been a challenge for a lot of different reasons. One, because of the glass block, obviously. A lot of measurements had to be done beforehand in order to know how far this wall was going to bump out. In fact, let me explain something. The original wall went about flush with this wall here, so we bumped out a good 12, 13 inches, about halfway in, into this wall, in order to have a little larger shower. So then I had to build this little knee wall that was exactly, exactly the same size as this tub deck because the tub deck and this had to be the same so that eight block high later you would be even at the top. So that got built. Um, the whole bench and knee wall got taken out. A new one was put in um, to that deck level as I explained. And um, you know, had to do the block. So as opposed to this, which is mortar, you see that white grout. Typically, you see this in Miami a lot. Um, I don't really like the mortar look. Um, it attracts because it's porous, like grout. It attracts mold and mildew and stuff like that. Um, so, went with um, another way to do this, which is um, silicone. So the silicone um, process is a little easier, a little quicker than the mortar, and. Uh, for those of you that want to know, there are actual, um, what they call, I don't know if I have any extra, I don't think I have any extra pieces, but they're basically spacers. They're pieces of plastic that are about uh, five foot long, then they're cut down the size. So if you can imagine one contiguous long piece of plastic at, at the horizontal, and then all of these are seven and a quarter, seven and a half inch pieces that are vertical that have to be cut. Um, Sometimes they sell pre-cut, but I had to cut all of those vertical pieces that you see and then the long pieces go on on top. Everything is silicone. Everything that gets touched, whether it's a spacer or a block, is silicone. And then the final process of siliconing the outside where you would normally have this mortar, you would have silicone. So it's a cleaner look. This wall is smaller and therefore it's a little sturdier. It does move a little bit. This one is very, very big and it's very, very heavy and it does move a little bit more. So these are not definitely not walls that you want to bump into, although there's no reason anybody would bump into this because again, this is such a huge shower that it really is irrelevant. Because we're so far away from the shower head over here, there will be no door. So you just step into the shower and you could easily have four, five, six people in here if you wanted to. Um, it's a very large six by four shower. And um, well, except for this little part here. So some of the challenges, this little wash rag bar, some of the challenges on this, uh, um, I always do niches. So this wasn't really a challenge, a little different. Um, she couldn't really find this border that actually, or not border, but um, trim tile that matched exactly um, the travertine so she bought something that she liked anyway and that's what I used and we use it along the top now this is where the challenge came in because this is slanted this is roof line right so this is slanted and the lines don't match up with the tile and because they don't match up with the tile this is a full piece I didn't cut anything off of here um, so you can see it's even there but by the time you get up there there's a discrepancy so I had to fill in a discrepancy and then even with that, it didn't really line up too well with this trim. And so I did the best I could, which I've never had to really deal with that before. But um, it's not perfect. I um, wish it was a little better cut than it is, but you know, it looks okay um, for what I had to do. These, these 16 by 16 are quite heavy and so are these. So anytime you're doing it on a ceiling or a slant or something like that, the thin set has to be mixed very, very thick. It can't be thin and runny. 
and then you have to trowel out both on the wall and you know trowel out on the back of what they call buttering on the back of the tile um, and let that dry till it's it's almost hard and then you can put it up there twist it around a little bit and everything and it'll stay um, more often than not it will stay sometimes it'll drop if you didn't do it right but that's how you get it on that type of angle and so that was a bit of a challenge uh, this mosaic was a bit of a challenge only because um, I have never done one in a shower and um, although it was a little different and kind of I don't know kind of fun to do I suppose insofar as you know normally I'm just tiling 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 in this case I got to do a little creative thing it was a challenge to get all the lines straight and everything and get it get it somewhat centered unfortunately I wasn't able to move um, this the shower head the way that it was originally put into the studs there's three or four studs holes were already pre-drilled into that when the construction was done so I had to kind of deal with what I already had here I couldn't really move the head and therefore I couldn't move the shower valve normally if you see my other videos you always see the shower valve is centered and it's always centered either on the wall or the drain usually try and do both um, but in this case I wasn't able to so it's a little bit offset and I was going to have the whole mosaic kind of offset to kind of you know make it more center but the customer actually wanted it center at the wall which is what I did um, there's a little cubby here uh, otherwise known as a niche which um, I, I've never done two in this case I think she wanted an extra one for soap and stuff like that um, so this is in the ones that I normally do and I trim them out frame them out if you will this one I didn't frame out because I didn't have any room over there on the left side so rather than framing it out just did it the way that I see it done mostly which is actually just having the edge of the tile show so of course that slanted this is slanted downward for water runoff the curb is also slanted although not as profound as I usually slant them but the curb is slanted um, just in case water gets over there it'll kind of run off but in this case there will be no shower door so there's no really reason to have it slanted down um, on these walls that same that you saw on the tub face over there that same uh, transition strip I used here um, just to kind of give it a clean finished look rather than just have tile set on top of it and I did the same thing on the back over here there's a little bit of a gap probably about half an inch between the glass block rail um, that you see the white part of um, and the transition strip um, so that gap is kind of irrelevant again you're six feet away from the shower head and so this wall most likely will never see any water anyway so I'm not really concerned about that I was going to fill it in with something and somebody still could if they wanted to but there's really no point um, so it's kind of irrelevant anyway uh, like I said this is a very very large shower and um, I would be proud to actually have this shower but it's not mine. Um, new shower valve, new shower head, obviously. And so, um, because it's travertine, because there's a lot of grout going on here, uh, the customer needs to seal this really, really well. Um, you know, it, it's still somewhat wet, and because it's humid outside and she doesn't run the air conditioner a lot, um, this really needs to dry uh, at least a day or two, let all the thin set and um, grout and all the different products that I use that have water in it let that water dissipate so that the sealer will actually get sucked in as much as possible especially around here where the shower head is so uh, anyway uh, that's the end of this job and as I said there's been some challenges here which have for the most part been enjoyable challenges because I don't run into them that often and of course um, it's a large bathroom, which I always enjoy doing the larger ones. It gives me more room to work in. And um, so I'm out of here. This is, um, as I said, 10 days from beginning to end. And that's what I always tell my customers. Anywhere from 8 to 10 days, I tear out bathrooms and build them back. So I'm gone.